<clears throat> so then I start. So greetings to everyone. <clears throat> uh, my name is Levan Tamisarosh, and I'm one of the INET core developers. And I'm going to do a presentation about TSN time sensitive networking in INET. Uh, you might remember last year I did something similar, but it wasn't actually time sensitive networking, it was the infrastructure for time sensitive networking. But uh, this year, we are actually focusing on the TSN features. So I'm going to do this presentation with lots of live demos. So I'm not, not going to make this full screen because I would, otherwise I would have to switch back and forth. So it's just easier this way. So just a little bit background, but uh, I think most of you are already familiar with this because there was a lot of TSN related stuff this some in the summit. So it's based on the 802.1 802 standard. And NIDA is the most important uh, areas where it's used in the in vehicle networks, or it's supposed to be used in the near future, and also in smart industrial uh, settings. And the goals are basically that uh, you don't want to have too many packet losses, ideally not, no packet losses at all, and bounded latency. So it doesn't have to be, uh, the latency doesn't have to be very small, but it has to be bounded with very little uh, variation. And uh, often fault tolerance is also, uh, important requirement with implemented redundancy. So in this presentation, the following topics will be covered. Uh, well, as, since it's called time synchronized, uh, time uh, sensitive networking, the most important part is, is having uh, a local time because you can't rely on uh, the simulation time. The reason for that is in a real network, the simulation time, which is you could think of the global physical reality time of the global physical reality is completely unknown. So you have local clocks and all those clocks can have all sorts of problems. They can just uh, go out of sync and things like that. So we have to have some kind of time synchronization. Then uh, we have this person stream filtering to, to deal with uh, uh, potentially faulty devices or all kinds of uh, problems so that the network bounded latency can be kept. And also uh, that this is, this is on the ingress uh, side of uh, the streams. And on the aggress side, we have uh, traffic shaping and scheduling. So the outgoing traffic from, from each port is supposed to be uh, done in a way which uh, 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 doesn't overcome the limits. And for uh, frame replication animation, we already had, had some presentation related to this uh, topic. So I also going to go into some details. And finally, some uh, side topics, frame preemption and cut through switching. This is also related to time sensitive networking because they can reduce the latency uh, dramatically. So, <clears throat> The first topic is uh, time synchronization. So the way it is implemented in INET, it's just a standard INET application. You can put the time synchronization application into any node or switch. Actually, the implementation was done. It's, it was um, done by the University of Rostock. So they also made a presentation or, or a conversation in this summit. So this uh, code was ported from their repository. Uh, we have uh, master region and station network nodes, predefined network nodes, but you can, as since this is a standard application, you can use this any, in any network node. And uh, this time synchronization, this does a link delay measurement, and of course, will uh, send through the network through a spanning tree, uh, the time synchronization messages, which actually set, change the clock times in, in the network nodes. The current version supports multiple time domains and multiple synchronization trees. And that there is this the question of uh, the master clock failover, which isn't uh, completely solved right now, but uh, there, there certainly need, needs to be, this uh, question needs to be addressed because uh, this is an important uh, part. INET uh, uh, already has the, the various clock and oscillator models. This was already present in the previous version and was introduced uh, in the last, last summit. So uh, this is not new. Mm. And now back to the, now let's go to live demonstration. With the famous words of Douglas Adams. Let's just don't panic. So I already prepared this presentation. Or this, or this uh, live demonstration. 
Okay, I'm going to start simulation. Okay, the simplest case is this network where we have uh, one mm, GPTP master. This is the called the TSN clock. This has a GPTP application here and a clock here. So basically, each network node in this network uh, network has a clock inside and has a as an oscillator in into, in a clock which is uh, not uh, oscillating accurately. So as you can see, there's nine ppm difference to the standard uh, uh, oscillation time, and all the other uh, devices also have the GPTP and, and the clocks. And if you just start a simulation, for the first few messages, just going to measure the blink delay. I'm not going to into too much detail. It's uh, basically these frames are just standard pattern frames with the GPTP uh, packet inside. And then we have this sync messages. So if I just uh, make this a little bit faster, then you can see that the GPTP sync messages are continuously exchanged between the uh, devices and the time goes pretty fast. So of course, this makes uh, sense because you don't have to do this very often, but uh, every once in, once in a while, you have to do this and synchronize clocks, as you can see here, the clock times. So basically, what, what it means that every device here has its own local time. So if it has an application or if it has an uh, that is dependent on time, like uh, sending packets every a uh, few milliseconds or seconds or whatever, it is based on the, the time measured by the clock. So it's not based on the, the simulation time, but on the, on the clock, local clock time. And it's also true for gate scheduling. So the aggregate gray gates in the, in, the, in the switches, as you will see later, uh, can have gate scheduling. So the gates can open and close according to some time-based schedule, which is also based on the uh, synchronized local time. There are more complicated cases because this was uh, with one master and one sync domain, and you could have a network which has multiple masters in it. So if I just run it, then you can see the red and blue arrows forming uh, two separate spanning trees. And uh, those are two time synchronization domains that uh, the blue belongs to the clock master one and the red belongs to the, the clock master two. And, uh, and uh, this is the the reason for this is that the, the, the clock the clock one is is the primary master and the second is the is the is the failover. So if you if anything goes wrong, then it can take over. And there are even more complicated. I'm I'm just a little bit fast here, but there are lots of uh, demonstrations as you will see. So there are even more complicated cases where you have still have two masters like this one, the TSM clock one and TSM clock two, but most masters have two separate time domains. So now we have four separate time domains. The reason for that is that is here we have a ring and one time domain goes clockwise and the other one goes anti-clockwise for both master and the, and the host standby. So it allows you to be protected against any link failure and you will still have a working domain for, for both masters. And even if one master fails, then the other master will still work even if one of the links failed uh, between the switches. So yeah, mm. and the next uh, configuration introduces an application into the network, where, uh, starting from device one to device four uh, with a flow, as you'll see here. Yeah, this is basically just sending some packets. And then we have, uh, of course, the synchronization and in the background, it's the same. The, the, this uh, black arrow, represents the application and the blue and the red arrows represents the sync messages. And uh, this is interesting because uh, uh, in this case, all the switches use uh, gate scheduling. So the application and the gate schedules are synchronized to the local clocks. It's important because if the local clocks are out of sync, then the whole uh, communication will uh, suffer. I mean, the end-to-end -end delay will, will be worse than expected, as you will see in the next uh, example, where we have uh, a, a link failure in this uh, link that connects the primary master to the switch will fail at some point, um, I think soon. Let me just go a little bit faster. I just want to show how you'll see that the synchronize, synchronization messages will just uh, stop being present in the network. Yes. 
So in this case, if the second secondary master doesn't take over, then you will see in, in the result analysis that this causes a large change in the end to end delay between the two applications due to the clock clocks uh, failing the synchronization. And in this case, there is a failover. So after the same period of time, uh, yeah, the, the clock is uh, disconnected and the failover takes place. So I think uh, this, uh, this is uh, about this uh, example, but I'll show you the results. I just uh, rerun the simulation so that uh, to a certain specific time so that uh, I get back the same results. I had before. So how, how does it look like if uh, we go into the simplest case where we can see okay, this is uh, basically the clocks in the first network, which is, is this was the simplest network where we have one where we had one master. And this uh, chart shows the clock time difference to the simulation time. So as you can see, there's a trend, increasing trend for all clocks are drifting away from the simulation time. That's expected because the master clock is not precise in itself. So every clock has has a precision, like uh, for example, a clock could have a microsecond precision, which means it cannot measure time smaller than a microsecond, but it also has some accuracy. That means that over time, it's just drifts, drifts away from the actual simulation time. And the other clocks that you see here is, is uh, show how they, they even drift further away from the master clock, but get synchronized every once in a while. So that's why they're this SOTUS kind of chart here. And the same goes for the more complicated cases, but the uh, only, only for instance, basically there are the more clocks. So it's not, uh, so that, you know, that there are two master clocks here. And if you look at the device clocks, then the device clocks are numerous because every device has multiple clocks and so on and so on. But the interesting part, which I wanted to show is uh, if you go into the normal operation case where we had the application in place, uh, the application end-to-end -end delay throughout the simulation for the four seconds is constant. Yes, that's because the, the, the clocks in the, in the network are synchronized to the primary master clock. So the difference between the, all the clocks in the network is always below a certain limit, which uh, doesn't cause any problem in the synchronization of the gates and the application and so on. But as soon as you have a link failure, like in this uh, case, what you see here is basically uh, there's still this trend, but it seems to be very small because at some point the master clock is disconnected and all the clocks, which was previously synchronized every once in a while to the master clock is, are no longer synchronized to it. So they just drift away from each other. And after a certain period of time, it's going to cause the application end-to-end -end delay to increase dram dramatically. And the reason for that is, is this uh, gate scheduling, which is a periodic gate scheduling. So once the delay, uh, once the difference between the clock times is large enough, the packets would have to wait another period period in, in the switches. So it's, uh, it's a drastic uh, change because it's like uh, a millisecond delay, but it was a few microsecond before, before that. So if we have a failover, it's a, uh, it's an interesting thing. So it's as you can see that the, those clocks that belong to the uh, to the primary master are still not synchronized properly, but the clocks used by the bridges and the stations are are different. So at the point of failure here, as you can see, the trend changes to a downward trend. The reason for that is that the secondary secondary master has a different clock drift compared to the primary master. The primary master was drifting away from the simulation time to, from the simulation time towards the positive values and why the secondary master drifts away towards the negative values. And the net effect of this uh, failover is that the application delay stays constant. So it's still a very small way as in the original example. So I think, uh, yeah, if, if anybody has any questions, just Feel free to interrupt me. So that's about the time synchronization part. Um, the next um, part is the per stream filtering and policing. So basically what we have in INET, we have this composable mechanism that uh, uh, we have a number of uh, queuing elements which you can use to build uh, various uh, modules. 
Yeah, but like you have classifiers, meters, filters, and, and, and gates and stuff like that. And you can build, a, a, as, as I will show you in a few, few minutes, in a few minutes, uh, you can build a, the various uh, stream filtering uh, uh, components out of those uh, components. And we also need to uh, add new components like uh, like these token buckets, chain token bucket buckets with overflow to, to, to be able to implement uh, the stream filtering. They also have uh, uh, support for asynchronous shaping through this elig eligibility time uh, scheduling mechanism. I will show this too. So this is a different example. Hmm. This is the stream filtering. I'll just Oh, before doing that, I just, uh, sorry, I just forgot to to show the in the file. It's not that interesting in the previous example, but uh, you can see it's pretty simple to configure the, basically what you do is just configure the master and slave ports for the GPTP uh, time domain synchronization. So it's not complicated. And even the failover is pretty simple. You just disconnect the link and switch to, to the uh, other active clock indexes. It's not automated, currently it's manual because the automated mechanism is not yet present. So I just forgot to show this, but so let's get back to the stream filtering. So in this example, we have this Dumbo network and uh, in this Dumbo network, we have four streams. Uh, both clients talk to both servers. And we, in, in, these, uh, in this link between the two switches, we want to 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 do stream filtering so on the ingress on the ingress side in both switches so for that we need to be able to identify the streams so this is basically the configuration you could have all sorts of um, uh, conditions here on the packets how to identify the packets that where which which packet is belongs to which stream so now we have four streams as you can see here and uh, those four streams in filtering component are uh put to four different passes which have different uh metering and filtering components as you will see so basically if i run this simulation it's just uh, quite simple here are some background some video traffic interlink with each other and if we go into the switch there's this bridging component which has a stream filter in it which has an ingress stream filter which has this uh compound module uh, and this module, basically what it does is this has, it has this classifier, which classifies the incoming uh, packets, which are already identified, which uh, stream they belong to, classifies them into separate passes, and they measure the using token buckets or some other measurement and filter the, the over, overflow out. And on the uh, outside, only the filtered traffic will pass through. I just show you that the actual Decoding stream decoding happens here because if you look at the frames uh, in the network, the network level, uh, this example doesn't use the text, the Ethernet text. So the filtering that so the stream identification is, is done by the Ethernet addresses. But it could be, as you will see later, later examples, it could be done by the VLAN IDs and PCB and so on. And uh, yeah, if I just uh, go here and uh, run a little bit the simulation, uh, it's a bit slower. You're supposed to see incoming packets and then they just, you know, go through the selected pass and then they get metered and, and dropped accordingly. It's not, uh, not too many drops in the, in the beginning that you will see that later on there are drops. The reason for that is uh, the traffic in this uh, example is it's kind of weird because the inter arrival time is uh, based on some sinusoid uh, function so that uh, the traffic is sometimes too low and sometimes too high. So if I go into the stream filtering example and we run simulations to, to get the expected results, then what I want to show here is so how does background traffic look, look, look in, the, in the ingress filter of switch one? So basically this is the offer traffic that comes from the source. And this is the filter traffic. And this is the traffic that is dropped. So the filter traffic and the, and the drop traffic 
sums up to the offer traffic. There's some burst here, which was already, which was actually present in the parameters. So what is the committed information size and bird size? You could have, uh, there are other meters like uh, two rates and three color meters with access to access information rate and access bird size and thing, things like that. And it's true for the, independently true for the other streams. So it's uh, pretty much the same. It's that this part is interesting because this is the second switch. So the ingress filter of the second switch doesn't actually drop anything. And the reason for that is basically is that they have the same configuration. So the stream is already filtered in switch one. So by the time it arrives at switch two, it's pretty much uh, fits into the uh, expected uh, bandwidth or configured bandwidth. And the same for the video stream, it's a little bit lower data rate. So it's less, uh, it's more, random a little bit but uh, yeah and there's this other configuration you could have different uh, filters like this sliding window rate meter and statistic rate limiter which is uh, is a different mechanism to filter i just wanted to show you that you could have all sorts of filtering it's different in the sense that it's sometimes the 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 traffic that passes through the filter is below the allowed rate which is five megabytes which is 40 megabits uh, even though the offered rate is higher, that's why, because it's just statistically uh, doing the filtering. Yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, I've shown this. So let's get back to the, to the topics. So next topic is for the aggress traffic, uh, scheduling and shaping. Again, it's using some composable mechanisms. So we have the same kind of stuff. We have queues additionally, and and the gates are going to be more important in this case. Uh, and different kinds of uh, classification methods are already implemented. We have credit based shaping and timer shaping and asynchronous shaping. And a timer for timer shaping, it's uh, it's kind of complicated in the sense that uh, for, for timer shaping, the parameters are not trivial because you have to come up with some uh, schedule, time dependent schedule. And but for that uh, purpose, INET will. Uh, offer different uh, automatic gate scheduling configurators, which can configure the gate scheduling for all network nodes, all interfaces, and all queues for multiple streams throughout the network. But of course, you can have have your own or own configurators. So again, yeah, it's uh, it's the traffic scheduling example. So the first one is the credit base shaper. So it's not very interesting in the network level. What you see here is just uh, some packets passing through between the two, two nodes, two different streams. But uh, if you go into the Mac layer of the interface, uh, here's the shaper basically. And it uh, consists of, and for the credit base shaper, it's quite simple. We have uh, just a standard queue and the special gate after the queue, which is called a credit base gate. And the gate is basically can either be closed and open. Some of you are probably already familiar with this concept. So if it's closed, then basically what it means that this uh, queue cannot uh, be used for transmission. And the uh, way it's closed and open depends on the amount of credits that it has and uh, the amount of credits depends on whether it, the the traffic that passed through that gate is actually kind of using the, the the transmission channel because it's using transmission channel and the number of credits will decrease over time if it doesn't then it's going to increase there are other conditions and complications but uh, the basic idea is this for the credit base shaper and uh, there's there's a time error shaper. It's a little bit, uh, it's very similar. I just, uh, I just want to show inside that um, it's very similar to the previous shaper in terms of structure, but we have a different gate here, which is, uh, which has um, this uh, uh, durations array, which is basically the, the, the open and close closing durations for the gate. So now they are configured to be open and close in tandem. So when one is open, then the other one is closed. And that allows to, to do some traffic shaping. Well, I'll show the configuration later, but it's very simple. And the last one is the asynchronous shaper. 
which which does well, which is a little bit more complicated because it also involves uh, the ingress filter. Because uh, this is the place where what, what happens here is basically the, the incoming streams, the packets in the incoming uh, uh, streams have will have uh, assigned some uh, transmission eligibility time according to some computation, which will uh, later on in the shaper prevent the frame to be transmitted before it is actually eligible for transmission. The way it works is if you go into the queues. We have special queues here. It's not that special. Just uh, uh, the, the only thing that is special regarding in them is that they have some uh, frame ordering, and they actually order the frames according to the eligibility time tag on them. And if this eligibility time uh, is smaller than the actual uh, simulation time, then the following gate is open. Otherwise, it's closed. So it means that no frame can go out on the interface before the transmission eligibility time. So basically, that's how the shaping happens. Uh, with respect to the configuration, I mean, well, I just run the simulations. So with respect to the configuration, it's not very complicated. We have the two applications, and for the credit-based shaper, it's basically it's that simple. We have some rate of gaining gain the credits and some transmission credit spending rate. And then for the timer shaper, we have this uh, durations when the gates are open and closed. It's the same, but one gate is open initially and the other one is closed. So it's then opening and closing in tandem. And the asynchronous shaper is the most complicated one, but uh, you know that one is not that complicated after all. So if you look at the results here, So in the query based shaper, basically the, the, the traffic that goes through you know, from the source to the destination is uh, uh, the relative traffic is according to the, to the relative uh, uh, traf uh, credit, credit uh, spend rate. So it's, uh, it's actually you know, working as expected. There's another um, chart here which shows how the credit accumulates over time. This is the current credit gap vector which uh, shows that as the, as the uh, credit grows when the, when the actual gate or the actual traffic class doesn't use the uh, transmission channel and then the gate states when the gates open and then and transmission actually happens. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, kind of complicated, but you get the point. Uh, for the timer shaper, it's a little bit different. As you can see, that it clearly shows that there is some time related uh, division happening in, in the background. So for the shaping, so like you can see four, four packets go from one stream and two from the other. Uh, by the way, the, the input streams are completely uh, random. So they, there's random message. Hmm. Uh, if you look at the gate states, it's, uh, it's quite simple. One, when one gate is open, then the other one is closed. So they're never opened both together. And for the asynchronous shaper, I have actually configured to, to for the two streams to be uh, uh, have the same uh, allocated bandwidth. So even though they are uh, randomly arriving and different, they just they just go out with the same rate. It's uh, it's interesting to see. It's the, it's the way it is, this is the how the gates open and close. They are quite random, but the out, output traffic rate is, is the same. And something that is very related to this traffic shaping, as I mentioned before, is the gate scheduling, which is basically for the time ever shaper, you have to come up with some kind of schedule, which you can do manually, or you can alternatively, you can use one of the configurators that uh, INET already contains. Uh, you know, in this network, uh, this is different network where it's, uh, it's an in-vehicle network, but it's quite simple. We have four cameras and four wheels, each uh, producing some traffic towards the HUD. And these green areas basically, they show the, the upstream gates towards the HUD for the two different traffic uh, categories. 
and the green arrow means that they are always open because that's what that was the uh, always open scheduler which means that it's going to uh, configure a schedule which which opens all gates all the time so it, it's not that interesting but you know that packets go through but there's this other uh, configurator which called a simple or eager configurator which is eagerly allocating the time slots for the frames it computes that which frame arrives at which which stitch switch from the stream for a point of time and allocates the streams allocates the gate scheduling according to this this isn't a, a an idea solution it's just a trio solution which uh, can be useful for as a baseline so as you will see that uh, as the time passes these green areas which which indicate where the gate is going to open uh, go from right from the right to the left because the center is the current simulation time and to the right you see the future and to the left you see the past and then we have uh, different schedulers uh, uh, a sort solver based scheduler uh, which is basically well it's not that interesting but uh, yeah, I mean the result uh, on that but I'll show it's it's a it, it generates a completely different uh, schedule and we have another uh, scheduler which is an external tool which is called the TSN scale and I'm, I'm just not going to run this because it's not that important I'm going to show you the results um, just run the simulation so in terms of configuration, we have the applications. It's not that interesting, yeah, and this is basically this is basically the configuration uh, configuration of the scheduling configurator. So it means that we have a number of streams from all wheels to towards the destination. What's the packet length? What's the expected interval? And what's the load max latency and stuff like that? And then the different configurators you can just easily plug them in like this, and then they are expected to to configure all the gates all the gate schedules in the network so that these streams can pass through and if the configuration is successful then you're going to have something like this i just uh, this is going to the sequence chart this and this uh, chart you see the axis each each x belongs to one of the network nodes uh well the cameras are omitted for simplicity and this is the case where the always open configurator was used so as you can see this is uh, all gates are always open and basically it's not ideal because for example this frame has to wait before it gets forwarded because um, another frame is uh, transmitted in between so but um, if you look at um, not the sats or based i wanted to show the eager one because the eager one is uh, is easy to understand here you can see that they are, they are uh, the, the wheel frames aligning very nicely. And this uh, process repeats at every period as, as the uh, wheel frames are transmitted. So the allocation is very accurate because all the gates are open for precisely for the amount of time that is required for the frame to pass through and they arrive in the shortest uh, end to end in the shortest end to end day but of course this uh, uh, this uh, solution doesn't scale very well because if there are too many uh, flows and so that's why we have the the, the solar based one and then this external tool which is the tsn scale external tool uh, this is the state of the art so I, I would say that uh, also capable of uh, producing uh, uh, schedules for very complicated cases but of course uh, uh, the the schedule is uh, is kind of different different from from the ones that you saw here, because uh, since these solvers are not uh, uh, optimizing, not uh, trying to find the optimal optimal solution, they just try to find a solution which fits with the with the maximum latency that is allowed. So any solution that that is good for the maximum latency is accepted. Um, yeah, mm, I think. Uh, I think that's where I wanted to show. And let's go back to the presentation. So the next topic is the frame replication elimination. This is the CB uh, part of the standard. This is a layer two uh, function, which is uh, basically consists of the following functions. So it has to somehow identify the incoming frames or uh, on each uh, uh, network node and uh, uh, based on the identified uh, 
stream, the stream uh, will be uh, merged or split, and uh, uh, this will provide the redundancy. And uh, again, as with the with the gate scheduling, uh, there's two separate problems here. One is the actual implementation of the application and elimination, and the other one is the as the is the configuration because the, doing the configuration manually for com for a complex network for lots of streams and, and flows between uh, different nodes is very tedious, as you will see, because uh, because it, it requires a lot of configuration. So if I go here, I can just maybe start with the configuration. <clears throat> so, yeah. so the manual redundancy, this is the first case where I manually configured each nodes in this network to 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 do frame replication. So the first frame code comes in. This is source zero, and then it gets duplicated in S one. The next frame is already coming from the source, but the first frame just arrives in S two A and S two B, and it gets again duplicated, and so on and so on until it arrives at the destination. And this process repeats all over again. And if you just uh, run this simulation for a longer period of time, then the rate of packet arrival, or uh, with the rate of uh, uh, the number of uh, successful received packets is lower than the number of uh, sent packets sent. The reason for that is, is uh, in this network, all channels have a uh, twenty percent uh, packet drop. So we actually here we have some small Python scripts which calculate the expected result, the, the rate of successful receptions at the end, uh, according to this uh, packet loss scheme. And we can actually have this uh, result. But uh, before before showing that, I uh, yeah, I, I wanted to show. Sorry, I want to show the, the configuration. So it's really complicated. If you look at all the details here, what are the relay and stream coding and decoding and merging and splitting and lots of uh, configurations there. So it's very tedious. So there's this uh, stream redundancy configurator, which is the next config in this uh, example, which uh, does, does the heavy lifting. So Actually, all you need to do is say that there's a stream S1 that goes from source to destination. And it's supposed to go through these four passes. So these are just passes, basically, uh, listing the network node names. And then the configurator will take care of configuring all the necessary components. This is a static configuration, so it's not dynamic. It's just uh, directly configuring the network components. And these black arrows show the result of the configuration that which links will be used in which direction by the stream. And of course, if you run it, um, not surprisingly, you get the same result that you can do at the, from the first experiment. And then I also wanted to show a more complicated configurator, which I call the JSON configurator. This is a little bit more tricky because it's not only configuring the redundancy, but it's also configuring the gate scheduling for the redundant streams. So using the gate scheduling configurator. So as you can see uh, here, uh, where, sorry, I think I, uh, Remove this one. So the first thing it does, it finds four different passes uh, based on the based on the failure protection uh, requirements for the for this stream. So the stream goes from source to destination, and this failure protection means that any one node of this set can fail, and we expect the redundant stream to be still uh, be. Uh, working from source to destination. And then there's this link failure protection, which you could see, let's say that any one link of this set or any two links from this set. And this uh, link failure protection is kind of redundant for demonstration purposes, but basically the end result is that this configurator finds these four different passes, which was actually originally configured manually. And then the second in the second configuration by the stream configurator also automatically. And again, the end result will be the same, except for in this case, we also have this gate scheduling. So it's not just uh, the redundancy, but also the gate scheduling. So the frames will go through according to the schedule. Yeah, if it, uh, just slow it a little bit. Yeah, you can see that. 
frames going through and the schedule is precisely at the right moment opening the gates. Yes. We uh, have the simulations. Yeah, it's not very interesting. Basically, what we see here is that the number of uh, packets sent and received uh, is basically that the, the rate of successful receptions is, is, is the same. That was uh, uh, calculated analytically. And this is how the convergence happens, basically. It's the, it's, this is the rate that was computed analytically in the, in the Python scripts based on the network topology and the rate of packet error per link. So that's, that's it. And I don't oh, know, I wanted to, I think yeah, I wanted to also to show, it's interesting to see the sequence chart here. It's kind of difficult to understand what's going on, but here you, again, you have the network nodes and uh, lots of, uh, uh, the, the, the first frame as it go, goes through, as you can see, the second frame is overlapping in, in time in, in, as, as it goes through the network. And if I open the, Gate scheduling variant, which is it's kind of different a little bit because uh, the timing is different in, for the frames. But you can see how the gates are open, and you can also see that uh, there are some extra open periods here. Those are for the redundant frames, but they are not repeated here. So because there was there, were, there was no loss, so there, there, there was, this, this uh, period is not used. But it's not always the case. So if I, for example, jump to thirty-five milliseconds, then in this case, it's used, this lot is used because uh, the, the other frame was lost and for redundancy purposes, it had to be used. And yes, I think, I don't know how much time I left. Now, there's this last uh, part, which is uh, about the frame preemption cut through switching. Uh, basically the reason uh, for, uh, uh, Frame preemption is to reduce latency by aborting the lower priority frame and immediately start transmitting the higher priority frame. This is done by using Ethernet frame fragmentation. And the cut through switching is, is uh, basically instead of store for storing and forwarding the frame, the frame in the switch immediately gets transmitted on the out, output port as soon as the header is received from the input port. So it's a uh, if I just uh, start with the frame preemption, perhaps. Yeah, here it is. Again, this shows, uh, this example shows that the architecture is uh, quite flexible because here in the Mac layer, you see two uh, inner or sub Mac layers. This is actually how the standard describes this. Uh, one is the preemptable MAC layer and the other one is the express MAC layer. So when I uh, run this simulation, this is the, what happens is basically in this case, each frame is transmitted with two, two packets as Anders was mentioning yesterday. This is the update, packet update uh, feature of Omnet being used here because when you interrupt the transmission, you have to update the packet because the packet gets truncated. And so here you can see that part. And what you can also see, if I, sorry, if I go into, into the Mac layer here, it's, uh, it's uh, internal, it's using packet streaming. The reason for that, because uh, this, uh, these uh, red lines means that the packets are not just simply being passed from one module to the other, but continuously being streamed from one module to the other over time so that they can be interrupted. And every once in a while, the Express Mac layer will interrupt the preemptable Mac layer. And that means that the background traffic is interrupted and the high priority traffic is uh, transmitted instead. Yes. Uh, again, if we go just and rerun simulation. It's very easy to see the difference between the normal operation and the normal operation is just the store and forward on the sequence chart because um, 
Ah, sorry, no, this is about the frame function. Uh, yeah, here you can see that the time sensitive frame is just uh, being injected between the background frames. So it's uh, nothing special as you can see here. But for the frame preemption phase, supposed to have frame preemption. Oh, frame reputation, sorry. Uh, here it is. So if we go to this, it's kind of different because every transmission is uh, represented by two packets being passed. One marks the start and the other one marks the end. And this is where the, where the actual preemption happens. Basically, it means that the first frame is originally was thought to be this large. Then later on, we just realized that it's going to be this small and this is the end. And then here comes the high priority frame and then the next fragment. So it's not that uh, complicated. And we can actually see the pcap file in the Wireshark. And this is the initial fragment. This is the high priority frame. This initial fragment of the background frame, high priority frame, and the second fragment. And as you can see, the Wireshark can actually uh, merge the two frames correctly together. So, so it actually works as expected. And regarding the statistics, yeah, um, the interesting part here is with frame preemption, the high, high, without frame preemption, the normal operation, the two histograms for the two different uh, categories are pretty much the same. The traffic is not the same, but the end-to-end uh, -end delay is the same. But uh, with frame preemption, the end-to-end -end delay is dr drastically reduced because it's, it barely fits into the chart because it's this, this small somewhere here down there. Mm. And then the last one is about cuts through switching. Where we have a simple scenario, which is the store and forward, where you can see easily that one frame is always stored by the switch before it gets transmitted to the output port. So it's, uh, it's as simple as that. And, but uh, with cuts through switching, we have a different operation. So the first frame basically goes through the whole, whole network. So it means that this frame is still being transmitted by device one while it is already being received by device two. And it is being forwarded. So this uh, means this internally, the packet is being streamed through this cut through layer and things like that. So it's, uh, it's uh, kind of tricky, but uh, you get the point. And it's easy to see the results again in the sequence chart and in the statistic. Just for young. Um, <clears throat> yeah, story forward, there's no big surprise there. As, as you can see, that one frame is stored and then transmitted and, and transmitted. And actually, the first frame arrives after the first, the second frame is already being transmitted by the source. And with cut through switching, switching it's the end-to-end -end delay is drastically really reduced because the first frame arrives away before the second frame is transmitted by the, by the source. So it's uh, completely different. Uh, I think I, I, I went through all what I wanted. So thank you for your attention. I also run out of time, so. If you have any questions, then feel free to ask. We are speechless. <laughs> it was very <laughs> long, sorry, but <laughs> lots of. One thing I wanted to show you, if, uh, if there is no question yet, which, is, uh, which might be interesting, is uh, how you could get these results from a sequence chart. Uh, for this purpose, I just copied one of the sequence charts because originally, if you open a uh, log file, is, is, this is not, not what this is. This is what you get because uh, this is the default. I mean, it's, there are lots of uh, stuff going on. 
but there are many options in the sequence chart and you can change many things what is visualized and how and stuff like that but there are presets so if you select this preset network node then it switches to the network node level of visualization and then if i also change the timeline to linear then we are getting close then i also filter out the camera nodes because i don't need the cameras just the wheels and we are oh it's typical see typical the demo, demo effect, effect. <laughs> that's why there was a don't painting so and then we also change the gate ordering so that the wheels are on top and the hot is on the bottom and the rear switch because this is better in terms of layout so we are getting close and we need some coloring for the message send we can say let's say all real messages are to be colored for from the dark color blue you could have lists here but it's easier and then we enable axis vector data and or i already uh, i think i ah that is it doesn't work because yeah because i was cheating uh, it's supposed to i already pre-configured that uh, the gate opening and closing vector data should be the default to be displayed on the axis but it doesn't work because this is a, a copy and there is no vector vector data uh, with the same name <laughs> so it doesn't work but other than that it's it's okay it works and uh, if yeah these are the camera frames they are much longer so it's, this might be interesting Well, I guess everybody has to digest this a bit. So probably uh, we should prepare for a more detailed discussion tomorrow. If there is no question. Yes, so tomorrow at 11.15, uh, we'll have a panel discussion about this TSN implementation. So if you are uh, interested, especially if you're working on a related area, then it would be pretty good to idea from you to to come here and um yeah and discuss how to how to go forward one remark there i have is this hdbq this is uh, a presentation on this summit is very nicely fits into this uh, framework because you could easily use this uh, in in a in a traffic shaper so that's that was basically the whole idea to make this so modular so that you can easily put in different implementations and they have a very nice implementation for the hierarchy of token bucket so it's it fits very nicely Uh, I have a proposal since uh, nobody's speaking. Uh, our original program stated that we should have a conversation session at 11.15. I would, since that's already passed, I propose to do that at 11.30. Uh, how about that? Because it's 11.24 right now. So, you know, give everybody a chance to recover. Makes sense. Yeah, uh, we can stop recording now, I guess.